Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And when Brother Junior said Ephesians, you know, your heart skips a beat a little bit, but the Lord knows all about that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take, on, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. I'll be preaching this morning, the Lord being my helper on the thought, uh, standing in the presence of the King. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the building that you've provided for us to meet in, Lord, and that we recognize that it's a gift from you. Lord, we pray for the upcoming meeting, Lord, that we uh, may be ready, uh, that we may lend ourselves as a servant to you. Uh, pray for the travels of all the people that will be coming. And we pray most of all, Lord, that here in the United States that we would see that there's a mission work left to do. That there's lots of people that have not uh, heard the gospel, not the true gospel. And we pray that you give us a burden for those people. Honor your word now, Lord, we pray with your presence. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, as Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he's fixing to uh, close his letter out, uh, he reminds them uh, of a number of things. And uh, the Ephesian church is one of the churches that's mentioned in the Revelation, in, in the church letters, and the Bible says of them, they lost their first love. Now, when you go beyond and lose your love of Christ... You have a real problem. Now, it's a wonderful thing uh, to love your family. It's a wonderful thing to love your wife. And it's a wonderful thing to love your church. But your primary love should be Christ. And that's what we as the Lord's people are to do. See, uh, the church is a wonderful entity given by God. And, and, and the Bible says He places individuals in the church. But listen, if you get thinking, if the balance can tip the other way, and you can start putting the church in the Catholic church perspective. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, we need to be very careful that our first love is the Lord Jesus Christ, not be like the Ephesians and leave that. So he says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren. In other words, he was talking to the redeemed. He was speaking to to the beloved. He was talking to the uh, born again. And when he says brethren, he means the church, not just the male members of the church, sisters as well. I guess the only reason you never see uh, that rendered that way in the Bible because uh, it would be sister. And that's a dry well. And we don't want, we don't want the women to be called dry wells. And, and so when he says brethren, he's addressing the entirety of the church and his desire for you and his desire for me is for you to be strong in the Lord. Uh, strong in the strength of someone else. See, we like to be strong in ourselves, don't we? We like to be, oh, you know, this is what I did. Well, so what? Was God in it? That, that's the question, you know. Uh, you know, it, it never frustrates me to hear a missionary say, well, I started so-and-so church. Most certainly you did not. And if it started, it was uh, started on the rock called Jesus, and he started it. And, and so then we as Lord's people, as Paul is closing out this church, the, this letter to the church at Ephesus, his desire was not for them to be weak and to be mealy and to be taken over by the world, but rather that they would be strong in the Lord. 
strong in his personhood. And so he writes, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Yeah. Now, you know what? If a young man is being called to the, the mission field, the first thing that swells up is I can't do it. I have this family. I have this child to take care of. I have that child to take care of. There are needs unmet. And you know what? You're ballpoint on. But you can do it in the Lord. You can do it in Him. You can't do it in yourself. That's a hopeless, that's a hopeless endeavor. Yeah. But uh, in the Lord, most certainly, you can do it by His goodness and His grace. And that's what Paul was writing about. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, every morning, every day... Every beginning, put on the whole armor. Because see, your enemy, Satan, the devil, is looking for a small place to get into. Uh, up at the uh, fifth intercostal space, which is the space between your uh, fifth and sixth rib, about right here, if you get hit something there and it goes into the skin, you're a dead man. And you know why? Because that's where the heart is. If it goes that far in, you're just as good as dead already. See, that's why in, in, in ancient times where they wore breastplates, the breastplates came all the way around to the sides. Because, it, and see, what the devil wants, he wants you. Yeah. He wants you. Now, does he want your soul? No. Because, see, the, the devil is not an idiot. The devil probably knows more scripture than you do. And uh, he knows that your salvation is eternal, but he'll bring you down. And the reason he'll bring you down, it's a testimony to everybody you know. Because, see, they don't know the Bible, and they don't know security of Jesus. So they just assume you go off the way. See, I told you it would never last. I told you that... He didn't have him. He didn't have anything in him. And you know what? They rejoice in that. They're glad in that. It makes them happy. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that uh, we need to get it all on. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, that's not a commonly used term anymore, so I looked it up to be sure that I understood it. And wiles means this, a number of wise intervention to get a person to do what he wants him to do. That's a while. In other words, if I wanted, uh, if I wanted all y'all to stand up and run out of the building, I might say, fire! And we get out of here. Now, the devil is crafty. The devil knows exactly what he's doing. And he's got more wiles than you'll ever know. Absolutely. He's got lots of them. He throws them out there. He puts them. And you know, this is the sad part. Y'all have heard of Pavlov's theory. Now, Pavlov was a scientist back a little bit before uh, 1900. And he had an idea that he could train, because it was all about reaction, a dog to sal salivate on command. So what he did, he took a nice steak, and he put it out there, and he rang a bell. And the dog got ready to eat, and he, he gobbled up the steak. The next time he did the same thing, ding, threw the steak to it. Pretty soon, he dinged with no steak, and the dog just drooled. And you know why? Because it was a prompt. And the devil is going to prompt. He's going to get an anticipated result. And so, as Paul is writing uh, the closeout portion of the letter to the Ephesus church, he says, listen, put it on... Because the devil's coming. The wiles are against you. He has many, many, many methods. He's on his way. 
verse 12. For we, all believers, all individuals, not just the church, because uh, see, uh, in a little bit after we have our meal and do Adam's class and, and go through our Sunday routine, we'll head home and we is still we. You get that? In other words, you know where he, where he digs me the most? And this is just, excuse me, been his character all his life when I'm by myself. Because you don't have the support of your believers. Mm -hmm. You don't have the support of other individuals. Uh, <coughs> if you don't believe that, what about Elijah? That's when he got him, wasn't it? And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we, we need to be wary of that and, and understand. So when he says, listen, he's coming, he don't leave just on Sunday, but out through the week. Uh, wherefore, take on the whole, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Now, a lot of people don't like this, and I do understand, and I think Ed was discussing this morning about how we are to honor government until it interferes with the things of the law, uh, of God's law. And Adam made the illustration as we was talking how they were to render unto Caesar that which was Caesar. And the tax was provided by the mouth of the fish. And they took it and they paid their taxes. And that's a, a wonderful good thing. But this principalities here is laws of the land. It's laws of the land. And he says you're going to wrestle. You're, you're going to be in wrestling against the laws of the land. You believe killing unborn babies is right? That's a wrestle, ain't it? Do you believe a man ought to marry men and women ought to marry women? That's a law of our land, ain't it? So we're going to be wrestling against that. Now, let me say this again. What, what's the goal in wrestling? It's different than boxing. You know, boxing, the goal is to knock them out. To Flatline them, you remember Rocky, old Rocky Balboa, and he looked like he'd been hit by a car, and, and you know, then he got the winning punch in, and it was all over with. But wrestling is different. You know, you know what the goal of wrestling is to pin you. And when you, it, it's not to knock you out, it's to pin you on your back. And when you've been pinned long enough, the person that pins you is the winner. So the devil's goal is not to knock you out. It's to pin you. It's to get you down. Whatever his means is available. And, and, and so uh, as Paul is writing here. He says, he says listen. We wrestle. He wants to pin you. He wants to get you to the floor. And this is what he's going to use. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world. Listen, you know what? Uh, we all take more notice of it, but when we think of witchcraft and, and you see some of these movies uh, of the darkness of Satan, listen, take heed. That ain't even a crumb of the reality that what goes on even in Poe, Dunk, Stewart County. It's a real thing. And we wrestle against it, the Bible says, every day. When you get around those individuals, it'll bring you down spiritually, right? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that this is our circumstance and this is our situation. And be aware that we are to wrestle back. Not, don't let them, you know, sometimes we get satisfied as long as we're not pinning. Hey, it's okay. Well, what about pinning them back a little bit? Get them down to the ground. You be on top. You be in control. Right? We don't like to think that way, do we? Uh, you know why? Our nature as humans is to tuck tail and run. You, you, you know what was different than David? He wrestled. He said, I, I've, taken the, I've taken the sheep out of the lion's mouth and I defeated him. I've taken the sheep out of the bear's mouth and I've killed him. 
you know what? He did it. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm just saying for self, if I see a lion and bear coming, I'm headed the other way. But spiritually, every day, we experience that. Now, the problem is, most of the time, we don't recognize it, and we write it off to nothing, and don't think nothing about it. But listen, it's a reality that Ephesus went through, and it is one that we go through, too. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Church, this is the evil day, the very wicked day that we live in. Having done all to stand. Now, what a wonderful, glorious thing. And uh, it is when I think about standing in the presence of the King. You know, this life passed, this life done, all the works and worries and the difficulty that this world has, and standing one day in the presence of the Almighty and in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, having done all to stand. See, that's what we ought to be crying. You know what keeps me going in a very dismal world is that very thought. You know what keeps missionaries Still saying yes in the light of everything else is that very thing. Standing in the presence of the king. Now a new missionary, he's coming in August, I can't remember. Going to Thailand, going to work with, uh, with Brother Green down there. Brother Green, I think, is 88. See, very soon he's going to have to pass the baton. And you know what? There's a young man from Cincinnati, Ohio. He said, I'll pick it up. See, standing. And, and, and what, what's the driving force? You know what? We need to wake up to the reality. One day, we're going to stand before the Almighty. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, well, I was, I was worried about that we wouldn't, have a, we wouldn't have a cell phone, so I just couldn't do it. You know what? You know how flimsy that sounds? In the presence of the Almighty that just said, go. It's going to be a pretty lame excuse, is it not? It's going to be pretty sad to see. But you know what? I have no doubt there will be many of us that try to come up with something uh, to replace this. So what are you going to do? When you're standing in front of the king. Now, the way that I understand these scriptures, if I get them right, if you have done all to stand, it's going to be pretty good. But listen, if you were a compromiser and, and, and you agreed to the earth and you left times when you didn't put the breastplate on and you got broadsided, you know what? You're accountable for that. Everybody would say, well, it wasn't my fault. You know, Matthew was making uh, uh, allusions to this today in, in the generation which we live and was talking about the future generation, generation of my grandchildren. And nothing is anyone's fault anymore. You know what? When I was in nursing school, and it's one they hadn't told me not, the very first two patients I had in my second term, same last name, same room number, both my patients. And I switched their medications. You know what? All I could say, yeah, I did. <laughs> now, because you know what? Saying, no, I didn't do it, that wouldn't change anything, would it? Right. You know what? They both still got the wrong medicines, and they both could have had very bad outcomes. Luckily, neither one of the medicines was much to write home about. But the fact is, I made a mistake. Now, what I did, I went to Mrs. Gibbons and said, listen, I've messed up. And just took my lumps with it. See, we don't live in that day, do we? You know, in the modern day, what would have been said, it was the patient's fault. They should have told me who they were. Right? But the reality is, no, there was responsibility there. You know who messed up? I messed up. 
you know, who did not look at the name bands probably carefully enough? Me. And so, where, when we get before the Lord, that's how it's going to be. You're going to be individually responsible for the service that you left behind. Or, in most cases in the modern day, that we did not leave behind. Now, on the boo-hoo side, yeah, that don't sound too good. But listen, think about on the other side. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, that, that's what I want. When I'm standing in the presence of the king, I want, to, I want to hear, you know, well, this and this is what you've done. You were faithful. You know what? Uh, nothing to write home about. Nothing to say about. Uh, what little bit I've tried to serve the Lord. <laughs> but I want it to be, I want it to be service uh, to the king. Go read the, the book of Job. And I want to show you a couple of facts here. Job. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 6. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. The Bible says this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Mm -hmm. Now I want you to notice two things. This, what, what most people will jump over and don't get out of these verses is the fact that everyone is accountable. Every one of them stood before God, including Satan. Now, he wasn't there to cause us trouble when I heard that preach. You know why he was there? Because he was a created being and he was just as accountable to God as Job was. He was a created being and he was just as accountable as the other angels of God. He was accountable to God. Uh, they stood before him to answer to him. Now, see, we need to learn accountability in this day. Oftentimes when Bella has done something wrong, it, it's time for the rod to come out. I'll say, Bella, why did you do that? And you know why? It's accountability. You know, just the fact that she gets her tail whacked is nothing. But if she thinks about it and says, why did I do that? That wasn't very bright. I knew mama and daddy would not like that. Why did I do that? Then she becomes accountable. And so we find here that that's exactly what it will be in the last day judgment. Why? Because he's the creator. We are his beings and we are accountable to him. Whether saved or unsaved, you will answer for yourself. Uh, Job 2 in the first verse, just to show you that this is a routine event. And again, there was uh, a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them, so to present himself before the Lord. So again, saved or lost, you're accountable to God. And you will give an answer. You will, you, you will give... A, a feedback on what you've done. The book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel 9, and verse 20. Daniel 9, and verse 20. Daniel, speaking of himself, says, And whilst I was, and whilst I was speaking and praying, and confessing my sin. Now he does three different things there. Speaking, praying, and confessing. Now I want you to see that not only 
that Daniel had uh, a, a personal burden for himself, but he also had a burden for all the nation of Israel, and he was praying on their behalf. You know what, uh, fathers, uh, we need to have a burden for our family, and we need to be interceding on their behalf, and we need to be going to prayer for them. You know what, our nation is a wicked place to live, and we can fuss all day long about Nancy Pelosi, but you know what, our big problem is this, just pray for the nation. You know what, you're not going to change Nancy Pelosi, but I know one that can. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need, to, we need to really get a hold of that truth this morning and pray like Daniel prayed and have an interest in it. Verse 21, and gave while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly, fly swiftly, touched me about the time of even oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Now, you talk about standing and praying. You know what? I've not seen the Lord Jesus Christ manually yet, but I will. I look forward to the day when these eyes literally behold the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and this, this Daniel, he saw Gabriel, the very, the very one that came to Mary and said, hell, hell, thou art highly favored among women. He saw, he saw the angel Gabriel. And uh, you know what? It made, a, it made a, an everlasting impact on Daniel's life. See, when, when we have an interest We'll see the person of Christ. Now we're not going to see him fleshly. I'm not going Pentecostal again. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see his nature. We, we, we'll see everything that impacts the sinlessness of Christ and the goodness of Christ and who He is in sacrificial offering. We'll see it all when we get close to Him. Acts chapter twenty-three. Now. I kind of I kind of did not include Acts chapter 9 because you're all familiar of the Damascus Road experience when the Lord uh, saved uh, Saul of Tarsus and he came Paul, the name Paul the Apostle. And, and you know uh, about that change in his life and that, that unbelievable experience. But if you look at that real carefully, he didn't see Christ till later. But I want you to notice, I want you to notice something here. Acts chapter 23 and verse 11. Acts 23 and verse 11. The Bible says this, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as, I, for as thou hast testified with me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, I want you to see the Bible says that he stood by. Now, if I come out here and I'm standing by Joey, I can see, right? He's right there beside me. And see, can you imagine that experience? See, see that, that experience of seeing Christ you know what? It gave him the fuel to place his head on the chopping block. Yeah. See, to see Christ. Can you imagine the deity and the beauty that is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's it just beyond my imagination. And I'm going to be standing there one day. Yeah. Standing in the presence of the Almighty. Standing in the presence of the King. Now, what are you going to say? The Bible says of the sinner that ye are without excuse. You know, I, I understand and I, I love and treasure the doctrine of predestination and election. But listen, dear friend, that's no excuse. That, that's not going to come up with, as, as something that's going to level the playing field. 
It's really not. Standing in the presence of me. Now, you, you know, th this is a thing that we don't get as Americans. When you're in the presence of the king, that's all that matters. That's the difference. Now, uh, in England, they still have Queen Elizabeth. And uh, longest reigning, and I, I, I could argue this point, she's known as the longest reigning monarch in history. And, but the problem is, she's not really a monarch. Because she doesn't rule that land. Uh, they have an independent government just like we have. And uh, she doesn't rule the land. But can you imagine being in the presence of someone that does? You, you remember, and he wasn't a very high government official, but he came to the Lord Jesus Christ at night. And he was begging for the life of his daughter. And he said, I'm a man in authority. And if I say to this one, go, he goes. And if I say to this one, come, and he comes. But there's nothing I can do about this. See, that's who standing in the presence of presence of the king is. He can make you go. He can make you come. He can make you uh, jump, jumping jacks. Standing in the presence of a deity. I just can't get my mind around that. But I know that it'll happen just the same. I, I know that it's going to be just that way. I can't wait for it to happen. I look forward to the day. You know, death, where is thy sting? Sting, grave, where is thy victory? Because see, after that, I'll be standing in the presence of the king. And, and, and you know what a glorious, glorious, wonderful thought that is. Uh, it, it takes the sting away. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, Second Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter uh, number four. Second Timothy four, verse seventeen. The Bible says, "Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me." Now, this is the second time that we find that that uh, the, that Paul must have seen the Lord Jesus Christ carnally, fleshly. And he talks about uh, this very text says, Demas had forsaken me, having loved this present world. But here we find, he says, the Lord stood with me. Yeah, everybody else give up on me. Everybody else quit. But you know what? The Lord stood with me. Well, what more? He saw him visually again. Well, what a wonderful, glorious thing that is, is to know that the Lord Jesus Christ Stands with us when we need him most. Last place. Revelation chapter 4. Very familiar verses of scripture. I'm going to just touch on a couple of things and we're going to close. Revelation chapter 4. John writing, he says, And after this, and that was the, letter, the church letters, and after this, look, I looked, and behold, the door was opened to me in heaven, and the voice which I heard was, it was the voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be here after. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. Now, the one sitting here on the throne is the Almighty. The one sitting on this throne was the great God Jehovah. The one sitting on this throne was none other than the person of God. And we find that John was able to visualize it and put it all together. Can you imagine seeing who he was? Seeing. It says that he had a train like a rainbow. And he's walking in and among the candlesticks. And you know what? What a wonderful, glorious thing to behold that. And just yet, it says that he had not fallen down. Now, in this text, and in a number of places, in fact, he, he, got, he got all mixed up one time and was going to fall before the angel. And he yeah. said, do it, see that thou doest it not. I am thy fellow servant. 
But we find in the last verse that the four and twenty elders, whoever they are, and uh, there are no, you know, I've heard a thousand different explanations, and you know what? They don't know more than I do. I just know there's 24 of them. It says that they fell before him and worshiped him forever and ever. That's what I want to do. Am I worried about the final judgment? You betcha. Because I know I've let him down more than I've held him up. But you know what? I look forward to the day of standing in the presence of the king and understanding everything that I ever wondered about. Uh, what about you? You know what? I believe there's a lot of believers that don't look forward to that day. And some, I would have to say justly so. And some others never even enters their mind. But let me flip the on switch for you and let you know it's going to happen. And you will stand before it.